There is only one true God. There is no various gods or other gods. There is only one true God. And there is only one way to know that one true God. And that is through a relationship with Jesus Christ. That is a personal, intimate relationship that you have with Jesus Christ. Throughout history, people have found themselves to be beholden or to be enslaved or to be dedicated, devoted to something in life. If it's another person, if it's a possession, if it's wealth, if it's a career, whatever, people find themselves devoted to something. And that's, that's human nature. That, that there's something innate in us that wants something bigger, something greater, something outside of ourselves that we go to, something that we can trust in, something that is our, our anchor that we search for. And people put all kinds of stuff in that place. People always find something that is outside of them that they're going to trust in, that they're going to invest their time, their resources, their energy, their, their belief, that they have something outside of themselves that they will rely on. And probably now, more than any time in the history of the world, there's so many more options and so many more things available for people to put their trust in, for people to invest in, for people to, to look to as something that they hold dear and something that's critically important to them. But there's only one true God. There is only one God that will satisfy and fulfill that need that we have. There is nothing else that you can put in place of that God. Although people try and people look to, to find something, those things will let us down. Those things will fail. Those things will get old. Those things will, will fade away. But there is only one true God. And we're going to look at a story this morning of a man named Elijah who... In this epic battle, if you will, you see this, this confrontation, this, this real uh, time where there's this a little guy against a big guy, there's good against evil, there's this, this confrontation that happens, and it's what all good movies and books and storylines are about, right? Even in sports, you want to see the, the, the team that doesn't have all the great skill set come out on top. And, and you want to see the little guy defeat the big guy. You want to see that, that the, the, the person that doesn't have the ability or shouldn't win come out on top. But we have this story that we read at, that we read today, that wasn't just a story. This really happened. Because the Bible tells us it happened. In God's word, it's, it's him speaking. And it's truth. And when you look at this story that Elijah went through with, these, with this king and with these people, at its very core, at its very basic level, at, 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 after you strip it all down, what you really look at, there's one question that has to be answered. It really boils down to one thing. When you, when you strip it all away, it's only one thing. It's a question and a decision that has to be made. And it is how long will you play with God? How long will you play with God? During the history of God's people, there had been these series of kings that had come into power, that had come in to rule the nation and were in authority. After King David, which the Bible describes to us as a man after God's own heart, there was all these kings that came into, into power and seemed like each and every one was doing worse than the previous one. In fact, the Bible says, talks about a king that says, and he did worse than his father. And it talks about another king. It says, and he did worse and more evil than the previous King Solomon, when he comes into power after David dies, King Solomon was kind of on the right track, and he starts to veer off a bit. And it starts to see, you start to see this decline in what happens of people being pulled away from the one true God. And it's almost like these guys were trying to outdo 
the previous king and the previous, king, uh, uh, the previous administration in terms of being evil. It's kind of like when we were children, right? You remember when you were a kid and, and your parents would say, hey, don't do this. And they'd say, mijo, don't do that, or mija, don't do this. And what did you do? You did that, right? <laughs> don't act in this sin. Don't say, no, nah, I, I was a great kid. I never did that. No, nah, you did it. We all did, right? We did what we were supposed to do. God's word would tell them what not to do, and they actually did the opposite. They, they don't, don't do this, and they did that. And it's interesting because it was a study I recently came across. It was a study that was done at Iowa State University. It was done in the late 90s by a professor whose name is Brad J. Bushman. And what he wanted to do is he took this time to study the effect of warning labels on humans. And so they went through this entire study to see when things have a warning label, label how do we react to those things? And basically what happens is when there's a warning label, it actually draws attention to do what it says you shouldn't do. For example, when they have music or movies or a product, it says there might be a warning that says viewer discretion advised. And so it's like, well, why do I have to be advised about this? What is it I have to look into? But what was more interesting in this study is when that label had instructions or had a little bit more information. When there was a label that said, this film contains violence, adult content, adult language, viewer discretion advised. They'd put those two different labels on the same movie, and once they put that second label that said what was in there, it drew more attention. More people wanted to go. More people had to go see, well, what was that adult content? Well, what am I being advised of? What is that language? What does it say? We can't help ourselves but want to do what is wrong. That's how these kings acted. These kings heard the word of God. They knew God said, don't do these things, and they did those things. You can see it throughout the whole book, throughout the whole Bible. If we look at 1 Kings chapter 14, King Jeroboam, it says, you have done more evil than all who lived before you. You have made yourself other gods, idols made of metal. You have provoked me to anger and thrust me behind your back. See, this king came and, and, and said, well, I'm not going to follow the one true God. I'm going to make my own gods, my own idols. I'm going to make them out of metal. And it says that he provoked God and then threw him under the bus. You're not important. Thrust him behind his back. I'm not going to pay attention to that God. I'm going to focus on this God that I have made. King Rehoboam, in chapter 12 of 2 Chronicles, says, King Rehoboam established himself firmly in Jerusalem and continued as king. So he took it by force. He was 41 years old when he became king, and he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem. The city the Lord had chosen out of all the tribes of Israel into which to put his name. His mother's name was Nahum, and she was an Amorite. He did evil because he had not set his heart on seeking the Lord. So his desire and his passion was not to seek the Lord. Remember, the Bible says that King David was a man after God's own heart. Was King David perfect? No. Did King David mess up? Yes. He was human. But his desire was to seek God and to walk after the ways of God. And it's not, when he talks about the heart, it's not that, that what's in your chest. It's about the core of who you are, what you believe, what you desire, what you, what you hunger for. What makes your thought process go in a certain direction. This king, his heart wasn't in that right place. He wanted to go somewhere else. And so he set up other, king, or the other idols and other gods to follow. Then you read about King Abijad. 1 Kings chapter 15, verse 3. It said he continued in all the sins his father had done before him. So he just said all the bad things that my forefathers had done, that's what I'm going to do. It says his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God, as was the heart of his forefather David had been. We read about King Nabab in, chapter, in the same chapter in verse 26. It says he did evil in the eyes of the Lord, walking in the ways of his father and in his sin, which he had caused Israel to commit. 
So this king, not only did his desire was to put up idols and to go in a different direction, but then he was encouraging the people to follow that as well. Following the people of Israel to go after other idols and after other gods. Over and over, read this pattern of these kings who did worse than the previous one and did evil. And did the desires of their own heart, not following the one true God. Then there's King Ahab. Chapter 16 of verse Kings, verse 30 says, Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. He not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, his son, the son of Nebat, but he also married Jezebel, daughter of Ithbel, king of the Sudanese, and began, and began to serve Baal and worship him. He set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal that he built in Samaria. Ahab also made an Asherah pole and did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than did all the kings of Israel before him. This guy said, I'm going to go tenfold on all the evil that I can do. No matter how bad all the previous kings were, I am going to do worse. I am going to be more evil. I'm going to be more deliberate in my thirst and my desire to seek idols. He actually built a temple for this God of Baal and set up an altar there. And not only was he, he following these false gods and leading his people to follow these false gods, but he was leading God's people to turn from the one true God to go after this false God. Now we can say, hey, wait a minute, that's, uh, that's pretty bad. How could someone desire to do that? We do that. Before we start shaking our head and looking at that and saying, what a shame, we need to look at ourselves because we do that as well. We put things before God sometimes more often than we want to realize. I've done it. I've shared in my testimony that, that there was a time when I was a young man that I put a car before God. That I had this car that I, I was little by little spending more time and, and more focus and more resources and more energy on that car and less on the things of God. Until one time my mom pointed out to me and said, hey, you've made that car an idol. I said, no, I didn't. I mean, it was a great car, okay? I mean, it was. <laughs> it was. Like Mike's giving me a thumbs up because he knows about cars. 77 Cutlass Supreme, black on black, 454 engine. I mean, it was like a jet inside this car. I loved that car. That was a problem. I loved the car. And my mom says, you made an idol out of that car. And it wasn't until she made me aware of that that I realized I did. We take all kinds of silly things and put it in the place of God Almighty. Sometimes intentionally, sometimes it is unintentional. It happens little by little. People use all sorts of stuff. Other people, relationships, sports teams, athletes, actors. They idolize them. And I think it's not a bad thing, but little by little, it pulls us away from the one true God and getting into an area that we're disobedient. It happens, and that's what happened at this time. See, there are things that are called sins of omission and sins of commission. And sins of commission is something that you know you shouldn't do and do it. And sins of omission is that you know you shouldn't do it, and you do it anyways. Sins of omission are acts of disobedience. So, for example, you, those of us who have children or maybe grandchildren or you, you, you have certain rules in your house. And everyone knows what those rules are. You know you're not supposed to do certain things. You know that this is how things happen in your home. And maybe one of the rules in your house is for the kids to say, hey, you know what? You don't watch TV or you don't play video games until you've done your homework. And everybody knows that. But one day, one of, the, one of your children decides, yeah, I'm going to play games. And you walk in and realize the homework's not done. And you say, hey, you're doing that and you didn't take care of this. Like, oh, all right. Sorry, let me go back and take care of that. They disobeyed. They disobeyed what you had asked them to do. It's what, John, or what James tells us in chapter 4, verse 17, 
where he says, anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. You know you should do it, but you don't do it. And sometimes we do it deliberately and sometimes we do it unintentionally. Sins of commission are a little bit different. Because in that same example, let's say you have these rules and you tell your child, hey, you can't play video games, you can't watch TV until you do your homework. And you walk into the room and you say, hey, there's your homework. Do that before you play games or turn on the TV. And your child looks at you, gets up, walks over, turns on the TV, grabs a remote, click, 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 starts playing games. And you're like, oh, no, he didn't. <laughs> and oh, yes, he did. <laughs> Deliberately, willfully, intentionally doing what you should not do. Full well knowing, not supposed to. And your child does that. That's a sin of commission. It is a willful act, a willful act of disobedience. And that's happened, that's happened throughout the Bible. If we look in the very beginning, God says, you know what? He creates this amazing world. He creates this beautiful garden. Everything is perfect. Everything is in balance. Everything is how it should be. And then he creates Adam and Eve. And he says, listen, I want you to enjoy all of this. I want you to experience all that I have for you. I want you to be blessed. I want you to go out. There's, there's so much for you here. And it's perfect. It's in balance. It's in harmony. It is my perfect plan for you. And I want you to just just." Soak it in and enjoy it, and, and we're going to have a relationship, and this is what my desire is for you. Just don't touch or eat from the tree that's in the middle of the garden. Everything else is yours. Just don't touch that. They knew what to do, and they knew what not to do. And then we find in chapter 3 this conversation that Eve is having with the serpent, and she even says it. Verse 3 says, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. And what did they do? I think I'll enjoy that because I'm not supposed to do that. We do that. And that's what King Ahab did. I believe that he full well knew. He knew the history of God. He knew the history of the people. He knew all the, the traditions, all the religious acts. He knew everything that had happened in the past. And he knew that there was one true God, but he said, I'm not going to follow that God. I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to set up my own God. I'm going to set up my own idols. I'm going to do what I want to do. And he deliberately chose to be disobedient to the one true God. And not only that, but he started making the people or having the people and encourage the people, even the people of God, to go in the wrong direction. So who was this God that he set up? Who were these other gods that they had put in place of the one true God? Well, the God of Baal is the God that it talks about. And the God of Baal is a God of, was known as a God of, futil of fertility. He was also known as the God of sun, the God of lightning, it was believed that he had the power to produce crops on the earth. It believed that he had the power to produce children and people. It believed that he had many powers. And this God, according to mythology and, and the people who believe in those things, he was the son of this God called Eli and of the God Asheroth, who she was the goddess of the sea. And the story goes that as Baal comes into existence, he overpowers Eli and does away. Now he becomes the most important God at the time. And to worship this God, it was believed that the type of worship was rooted in all types of sensuality. All types of exploring your senses in types of, of sexual activity and types of sacrifices and types of doing things as deviant as you could to be able to appease this God and please this God of Baal. And it was believed that what they would do is they would have these prostitution, prostitution happening inside the temple and orgies in the temple and then all kinds of crazy acts in order to worship this God of Baal. And they also would sacrifice. And the most, I guess, best sacrifice they could offer was children. Their firstborn and babies would be sacrificed 
in terms of, of wanting to worship this God. If you look at that and you look at our world today, do you see some similarities there? Do you see how people are trying to do all these crazy acts and trying to fulfill the most craziest desires they have and how we don't value children as we should? And then what was this other God? This other God, this Asherah God, well, she was considered to be the goddess of love and the goddess of war. And very similar, she was worshipped and adored by doing the most acts you could do to, to, to heighten or enjoy your, your own activities or your own desires, to be able to fulfill your own lust. And the interesting thing about these two gods is that they were highly adaptable, meaning that if I wanted to do this and it didn't really fit within the realm of worshiping these gods, then I can put that god there and then do that and it would be acceptable. Or if I wanted to go in this direction and it hadn't been done before, I can move that God and put him there. You see, because then that way you don't have to be held accountable. Then that way you don't have to be held up to a standard. Then that way you don't have to face truth because it is whatever you want to make it. And then you can feel good about doing whatever it is that you wanted to do. And those are the gods that... King Ahab at this time put in place and said, this is what we are going to worship and this is what we are going to follow. The goddess of, of Ashroth also was the goddess of fortune telling, of divination. And again, if you look at our society, what are things that people invest their time, energy, and effort in? It's fulfilling whatever desire and lust they have, looking at, at all these different things to be able to, to justify and make themselves feel good about doing whatever they want to do without having to give an account for those things. This is what's happening at the time that Ahab is, is the king. And they're going through and they're trying to kill and destroy all of the things that God had put in place. And they're going through and they're killing the prophets, the messengers of God. And then one day, God sends this man to face him. And we read about that in chapter 17, where then Elijah goes to Ahab and says, just want you to know, no rain until I say so. No rain until I say. And then God tells him, leave. Gives him the message and God tells him, go, go into the desert, go into the wilderness, go into a cave. He says, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to have ravens come and bring you everyday food. There's going to be a brook with water. I'm going to provide for you. And to me, that's kind of really amazing if you think about that. Because over the last I don't know, five or ten years, we've been thinking about how Grubhub and, and Uber Eats and all these services are so great. Well, God had Raven Express because he was having food brought right to the door, right? It's like Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun, right? He's having, God is having these ravens bring food. And he's having supplies, and he takes care of his. He is supplying his every need because he is the one true God. He doesn't miss. He doesn't forget. He doesn't go away. He was always with Elijah during that time. During that time, the people are living it up and doing whatever they want to do, and they're just enjoying life and satisfying all their desires and going a different direction without noticing that judgment is coming slowly because a drought happens. And the brook dries up, and God tells him, there's a widow that I'm going to use to take care of you, so go to her. And he, he goes to the widow, and the widow says, he says, hey, can you make me some food? And she says, see this little jar? There's just enough flour for me to make something for me and for my son to eat, and we're going to eat this, and then we're going to die. So she had given up on life. She said, there's no hope but God. That flour was there today. It was there tomorrow. It was there the next day. It was there the next day, the next week, the next month. God continued to provide and God continued to supply because he is the one true God. He didn't forget about Elijah. He didn't forget about the widow. He didn't forget about the, that child. He continued to provide for those who believed in him. God then tells Elijah, okay, now it's time to go back. Go back and meet with the king. And so he goes back, and this is what it says in 1 
Kings 18. When he saw Elijah, he said to him, Is that you, you trouble of Israel? I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied. But you have. Your father, but you have. Your father's, uh, excuse me. But you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and had followed Baal's. So he comes in and says, there you are. You're the guy who's caused all the trouble. You're the guy that's caused all the problems. You're the one that's making life miserable for the people here. You're the one who has brought this to us. And he says, nah, not me. It's you. You and what you did. It's what you have been following that's brought this problem. And you know, we do that as well. When we're going through things in our life, there's a lot of times we wonder why this is happening to us and why someone made this happen to us. And, and God, it can't be me. It can't be me who's responsible. It can't be my decisions that are causing this to happen in my life. We don't want to be accountable for the wrong things that we say and we do in life. We always want to look outside and blame somebody else. We always want to look outside and say it was that person or that person or the reason this is going on is because of that. Maybe we need to stop and check our walk with the Lord. Maybe we need to stop and take inventory and find out where we are in our relationship with God. Now, does that mean that if we have a great relationship with God that we're not going to have problems? No. No, there's going to be trials and tribulations. Jesus himself said, in this world, you will have problems. Stuff is going to happen. But there's a difference when you have a relationship with God and stuff happens because there's joy in your heart. There's peace. And you know in whom you have trusted. You know that you are following the one true God and that God is going to work things out. And then there's a difference when you don't have that relationship and stuff happens. You start looking for who to blame. You start looking for why it's happening and, and it can't be you. And that's what Ahab's doing. Ahab's saying, hey, you're the one who's caused the problems. You're the one who's made all this situation bad for us. And Elijah says, no. Look at your life. Look what you've been believing in. Look what your forefathers and, and, and all those before you have been doing. You have turned away from the one true God and you've decided to follow your own desires and set up your own gods. And that is why what is happening is what is happening. It's pretty hard when you have to check yourself against truth and be honest about it and realize I'm the one who's responsible. There has to be repentance in me. I'm the one that should change because God doesn't change. His ways are always right. And if you're walking in the ways of God, and if you're walking in, his, in obedience to him and in his words, then you are blessed. No matter what the circumstances are, no matter what is happening, you are blessed. Psalms 119 says, Blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are they who keep his statutes and seek him with all their hearts. Amen. Elijah was blessed. He may have been in a cave. He may have had ravens bringing him food. And, and he went to a widow who thought she was going to die. She was blessed. They were blessed. Why? Because he was blameless in his ways. And he was trusting in the one true God. In spite of what was going on, in spite of what happened, he believed in the one true God. Elijah comes back and tells Ahab, listen, it's you, and it's what you've been believing in. I believe, I believe in the one true God. So go ahead and get all the people. Let's meet on Mount Carmel, and let's go ahead and have it out. It's the battle that's going to happen. And I thought that was pretty cool because here you have the king who's supposed to have all authority and rule is taking orders from some guy who just came into town to let him know this is what's going on. And he obeys. He gets all the people. They get everyone to Mount Carmel. They have all the prophets. There's combined 850 of these prophets that have been going throughout the kingdom and telling people to serve Baals and to serve Asheroth and to do whatever you want. They all come, and they're going to have this confrontation. Elijah says, look, we're going to get sacrifices. You do what you want to do. When you're done, I'll do what I want to do. And the, the God who brings fire from heaven, that is the one true God. That's the one, the undisputed God that we will look at. So the battle is set face to face. Chapter, two, or chapter 18, verse 20 says, So Ahab went throughout all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and he said, 
How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if it is Baal, but if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. I thought that's pretty amazing. Because they had invested all their time, energy, and effort in the Baals and the Asherahs and, and living their life. And here's their opportunity to be able to prove. And Elijah says, listen, how long are you going to play with God? If what you believe it really is God, then follow that. But if this is the real God, follow him. They didn't say anything because it was an uh-oh moment. It's like, oh, we, we're going to have to deal with this. There is truth now that we have to confront. Their falsehood was being exposed. They were having to look right at truth and make a decision. It reminded me of, and this is just between us, okay? Don't tell Sarah, my daughter. But it reminded me of my daughter when she was little. My wife and I had this cookie jar on the counter in the kitchen. And we would put these little chocolate chip cookies in there. And we would notice in the mornings that there would be less and less cookies. And we couldn't figure it out. My wife thought it was me, and probably sometimes it was, but we couldn't figure it out. Until one time, I got up early for work, and I go, and there's Sarah. And she's sprawled out on the couch, got a cookie in her hand, sleeping, drool coming down, crumbs coming down. So I said, ah, it's her. So I said, hey, mama, listen, you can't be doing that. I cleaned it up, you know, cut her to bed, and you can't be doing that. So taken care of. But then time passed, and it started happening again. So we say, hey, Sarah, are you? And she's like, no, must be Matthew, must be Nathan, not me. One time we bought these fudge cookies, and we had them in there. And so we would come in the mornings, and we'd see there's a washcloth now with residue of fudge cookies. <laughs> and we check, and, you know, the kids are like, until one morning, there was a lot of fudge on the kitchen. And so when the kids wake up, Sarah comes out, and I said, Sarah, did, did you have fudge cookies? And she says, no, no, Daddy, it wasn't me. I said, are you sure? She goes, no, 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 it wasn't me. And I said, come here, Mama. So we go to the bathroom, we had a big mirror, and I turned the light on, I put it in front of the mirror, I said, are you sure you didn't have cookies? No, it wasn't me. And I said, what do you see in the mirror? And she looked, and she got the sheepish grin on her face, <laughs> and she put her head down, because what had happened is, although she washed her hands and her face, she didn't realize that the fudge had dripped all over her pajamas. <laughs> And she's got fudge on her pajamas, on her sleeves and stuff. And she, no, it wasn't me. Yeah, it was you. She realized and she had no words. It was like, that's what happened with these people. When Elijah says, listen, if your God is who he says he is, then serve him. But there is only one true God. And they were faced with the fact that truth was right there in front of them. There was nothing else they could say. Except Elijah says, so how long are you going to play with God? How long are you going to go through this? How long are you going to be testing God? They have this battle. The prophets start doing their worship. And you read the story and they're they're cutting themselves and they're doing all that they're, they're due to serve and honor and worship their God. And it's going on for some time. And then we read in verse 27. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he is God. Perhaps he's in deep thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he is sleeping and must be awakened. So he's taunting them and he's provoking them. And when you read that, you're like, okay, he's like eh, sticking his finger in their eye. And he's like, ah, laughing at them. But maybe not. Maybe what he is saying is, do you realize the foolishness of what you're doing? You know, sometimes as Christians, that's what we want to do. We want to go and beat people over the head with the Bible. We want to just get in their face, and we want to embarrass them about where they're at, when really all we have to do is just live a life pleasing to God and let our life be a testimony. And then when people start asking questions, just help them understand the foolishness of how they are living their lives. To say, is that really how you want to live? Don't you know there's a God that loves you, a God that wants right for you, a God that, that, that has given his life for you? 
So he's taunting them. And he's probably telling them this. Hey, he's deep in thought. You say he's God, right? But maybe he's deep in thought because you're not as important as you think you are to him. And he's thinking about other things. See, my God is always thinking about me because he loves me. He goes on and says, well, maybe he's busy. He's doing something else because you're not of high value. But see, my God is always working in my life. He's always connected to me. He's always helping me and, and doing things around me because he's the true God. He says maybe he's traveling. Maybe he, he went to go do something else that's more important. That's why he doesn't hear you because he's not omnipresent. But my God is. My God is everywhere, all the time. He doesn't take vacations. He doesn't have to say, i got to stop working here because i got to go over there. No, he is all over the place because he is the one true God. He says, well, maybe, maybe your God is sleeping. That's it. He's sleeping you to wake him up. Well, then he's not all powerful because my God never sleeps. My God is always alert. His ears always attentive to the prayers of his people. His eyes is always watching his sons and daughters. My God doesn't take vacations. He doesn't rest. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He is the one true God. Your God isn't. They go through all this to try to awaken their God and nothing happens. And then Elijah says, my turn. Excuse me. You can just picture it. Like, you'd like to get a ticket to watch that, right? Just like, wow. These guys now are worn out. Some of them probably passed out. They're bleeding because they've been cutting themselves because those were the things that they would do to, to serve their God. And now everything is quiet. They're done, moved out of the way. And in verse 36, it says, At the time of sacrifice, the, private, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant, and have done these things at your command. Answer me, O Lord, so these people will know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you are turning their hearts back again. He doesn't do all the song and dance. He doesn't do all the crazy stuff. He just simply has this prayer. It's a simple prayer. And he just says, and, and if you look at that, there's some very key things in that simple prayer he said. First, he's saying, let it be known that you are God. Everything that's going on, let everybody know that you are God. Then he says, and let it be known that, that I'm just your servant. I'm just a spokesperson here. I'm listening to what you have told me to do. I'm being obedient. I'm following what you want me to do. And it's because you are God. Not because I have my own desire. Not because I'm God. Not because I've placed something in. No, it's you. So let them know that I'm your servant because you are God. And when you do this and you answer this prayer, it will be clear. They will know who the one true God is. And it's not these false gods that they've been following after. It's not their desires. It's not what they wanted to do. But it is you who is the one true God. And at the end, you see repentance. Because they recognize, and he says, and that you are turning their hearts back again. Making them aware of what God did, who God was, and who God is. That he's the one that parted the Red Sea. That he's the one that brought manna from heaven. That he's the one that brought water. That he's the one that did, dealt with Pharaoh. That he's the one that does the healing. That he does the restoration. That he brings the miracles. That he is the one true God above all other things. That they will know that he is God. After that, fire comes down. Consumes the sacrifice. Consumes the wood, consumes the altar. They had doused, saturated everything in water three times over. It consumed all the water. Everything was wiped out because the one true God made his presence known in fire. To his honor and to his glory. And everybody saw that. Then those that were prophets, judgment came to them. Because if you read that story, they received judgment. They were all killed for what they were doing. So the question for the rest of people was the last point this morning. Who will I serve? It's the same question that we have today. Who will we serve? 
Who is it that we're going to put our trust in? Who is it that we're going to follow after? Who is it that we're going to put our, our confidence in? Who is it that we're going to seek? Is it the gods that we establish that are adaptable and portable and, and, and will satisfy our needs? Or is it the one true God? Jesus, when he preached, he made the same statement he told the people. He told the people this in Matthew. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Money was a form of God. Money was, was what people were putting in, in their, their, their hearts that they were after. It represented anything other than God. And Jesus saying, you can't have your foot in this camp and have your foot in this camp and think that everything is okay. Because you're going you're gonna to be devoted to this or you're going to be devoted to this. You're going to desire this or you're going to desire this. You're going to be led by this or you'll be led by this. And Jesus asked the same question. Who are you going to serve? The book of Psalms tells us, and it gives us this, these foundational truths and helps us understand that as we follow God, it says in Psalms 1-1, Blessed is the man and the woman who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the way of the mocker. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. You're blessed when you follow the one true God. But you're not when you follow your own desires and your own ways and the ways of this world. And you see that progression in that Psalms. That you, you, you look and you start walking in the wrong direction. You start listening to the wrong things and you get comfortable with that. And you can slip away so easily. God is calling people to repentance. God is calling us to follow the one true God. And it is him. God is telling us to reject all forms of sin and all forms of, of this life and all forms of, of, of what this world tells us to do and to follow after him. And even those of us, because remember, this was happening in Israel. This was happening with, with Elijah and with, the, with the King Ahab, where there were people that weren't followers of God and people that knew God. Even within the church, there are people that don't follow God. And that we do and say things that are not in line with God's ways and God's word. There are times that we are not obedient to God. And we know what his word tells us to do. And we choose not to do it. We know how we should live and we sometimes deliberately and sometimes we just kind of lose our way and don't follow what God tells us to do. God is saying, how long will you play with me? There is only one true God. There is no other. This same question was brought up before the people of God earlier. When Joshua was recapping the whole history of Israel and recapping the whole journey. And he was challenging the people. And Joshua said this in chapter 24. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your forefathers worshipped beyond the river and in Egypt. And serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether the God your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. There is only one true God. And even though we're here in this world and even though we're in this, this messed up world that has all kinds of crazy things happening... God is still God, and he's still on the throne, and he's still in control of things, and he is asking for a people to follow and serve the one true God. Amen? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for this opportunity that you've given us to gather in this place. Help us, Lord. Work in each and every one of us, Father, in the way that you want to work in us, so that, Lord, you would convict us in those areas that we need conviction. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us for, for setting up idols and setting up gods and, and not being obedient. Forgive us, Lord, for knowing the right thing to do and not doing it. Forgive us, Lord, for, for gossip, for talking about our brothers and sisters, for saying and acting in ways that are not representative of you. We say with our lips that we, we follow you, that we believe in you. 
But our actions, sometimes our actions don't line up with that. And Lord, sometimes we, we do things by mistake. We do things in error. We do things we, we, we really don't realize. And your Holy Spirit convicts of those things. Let us repent of that. But Lord, there are times that we become stubborn because of the hardness of our hearts. And we act and do things that we know we shouldn't, but yet we make that decision, that willful decision to do what is wrong. Have mercy on us and forgive us, Lord. Change our hearts. Help us to follow you, to make that decision to serve you, no matter what the cost, no matter how difficult it may seem, no matter what the struggle is, but to remain faithful and trusting in you because you are the one true God. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.